This week on WealthTrack, a rare in-depth interview with research affiliates Rob Arnott. Emerging markets bonds would be where I'd want to put my bond money and international and emerging market stocks, the stock money. I love U.S. assets when they're cheap. They're not. The financial thought leader, innovator, and global fund manager analyzes the state of the markets and investments this week on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Funding provided by Morgan Le Fay Dreams Foundation, Clearbridge Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, First Eagle Investment Management, and Strategus Asset Management. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. Large cap U.S. growth stocks, particularly tech stocks, have been the overwhelming winners of the last decade. They now dominate the market. The top 10 S&P 500 stocks, including the FANGs, account for more than 25% of the index's total market value, a concentration that worries some market watchers because it is reminiscent of other market tops, such as the dot-com bubble when Internet stocks made up over 30% of the S&P and the credit bubble when banking stocks reached more than 20%. With the exception of short-lived spurts, value stocks, small-cap stocks, and international stocks have badly lagged. Well, this week's guest believes the days of this concentrated outperformance by large cap growth stocks are numbered and suggests some alternatives. He is financial thought leader, innovator, and investor Rob Arnott, chairman of the board of research affiliates, which he founded in 2002 as a self-described research intensive asset management firm that focuses on innovative products. Among the innovations that he has pioneered is fundamental indexation, building indexes with stocks based on the size of their fundamentals, such as sales, profits, cash flow, book value, and dividends, not their stock price. Research Affiliates has created numerous fundamental indexes for a wide variety of markets and asset classes around the world. Among the many funds that are not created and now co-manages is the PIMCO All Asset Fund, launched in 2002 and the first of its kind at the time. It now has more than $17 billion under management. As its name suggests, PIMCO All Asset can invest in a wide range of assets through various PIMCO funds. Its goal is to provide attractive real returns, 5% above the consumer price index over a full market cycle, and provide diversification away from developed market equity risk. It has generally done so on both counts. Morningstar notes that the fund tends to outperform in market declines and maintain lower volatility than its category peers. I asked Arnott why he believes the long era of large cap growth dominance could be finally coming to an end. Well, concentration like this has been seen before, but not often. Uh, if you look at the top five names in the S&P 500, they comprise about 25%. The last time that happened was 1975, and it sure didn't last all that long. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that's just fascinating is that the rotation in the top tier names in any index is prodigious. We looked back over the decades, the 10 largest market cap stocks in the world in 1980. All American companies, half of them oil companies, how many of them were still on the top 10 list 10 years later? Uh, two, two out of 10. Um, 10 out of 10 underperformed the world index, eight out of 10 in underperformed by enough to fall clear off the list. What about 1990? Well, that was peak of the Japan bubble. Eight out of the 10 largest companies in the world were Japanese stocks. How many of those top 10 were still on the list 10 years after that? Two. This time you had one of them, one of the 10 actually outperformed the world index. Nine out of 10 underperformed, eight fell clear off the list. Brings us to 2000. Now you're looking at the peak of the tech bubble. Half of the top 10 names were tech stocks. Most were US. So how many of those were still around 10 years later? Not two, three. <laughs> <laughs> so you had eight out of 10 underperform, seven fall clear off the list. And that brings us to 2010. Uh, 2010 wasn't peak of any sort of bubble. It was the most diverse list of any of the last 40 years. But maybe because it was no bubble, 
um, you had more survivors. Uh -huh. You had two survivors still on the list today, um, uh, Apple and Microsoft. That's it. And so you had eight out of 10 underperformed by enough to fall clear off the list. With cap weighting, those 10 are your 10 largest holdings. And historically, eight or nine out of the 10 underperform, seven or eight out of the 10 fall clear off the list. Um, today's top 10 list is overwhelmingly tech. Now, right. some of them aren't categorized as tech. Amazon's categorized as a retailer, but really it's competitive advantages tech. So when we look at today's top 10 list, natural question, how many of them are still gonna be on the list in 10 years? If history is a guide, eight or nine out of 10 are gonna underperform. Seven or eight out of 10 will underperform badly enough to fall clear off the list. And it's anybody's guess which the two or three winners will be. And actually, Rob, it's really interesting. I just saw some research from Strategus, which is an independent research firm, um, about Amazon, which, uh, you know, 55 analysts have it on their buy recommendation list. Um, but for the last, I think, 14 months or something, uh, it has actually gone nowhere. And so it's underperformed. So already, are, are these the kind of cracks that we're starting to see in these dominant big tech names? I think so. I think yeah. I think the um, the growth value cycle probably finally turned last September. And why do you say that? What what happened last September? Value rebounded handily from September through May, and it's given up some ground since then. But the narrative last summer was. COVID is a big deal. COVID is going to cement the strength of uh, the tech leaders right. um, for the next generation and human behaviors will change. Um, uh, video discussions like this one will be far more normal than they ever used to be. Um, and oh, by the way, uh, COVID is going to lead to sweeping bankruptcies across large swaths of the economy. And where will that be? It'll be on the value side because that's where the profit margins are thin and the growth is slow and the products are behind the curve. That narrative is all true. Narratives usually are true. Uh -huh. What people don't ask when they hear these narratives is how much of this narrative is unknown to the market and how much of this narrative is already fully reflected or perhaps over reflected in current share prices. So what turned last fall was um, you had the uh, advent of uh, vaccines. Mm -hmm. You had uh, bankruptcies turn out to be not particularly higher in 2020 than in 2019. And so people were, and the stock market was re recovering handily. So people were looking at value and saying, well, wait a minute, maybe these companies won't go bust. And if they don't go bust, are they cheap? My goodness, they sure are. And that led to the snapback. But the reality is value, the spread between growth and value today is second or third widest in history, depending mm -hmm. how you measure it. The widest in history was last August. The second widest was peak of the tech bubble. Right now we're in that same range. So it's really interesting to me that we've seen a big rebound in value, uh, retracement, and right. people get another bite at the apple. If you have the courage, buying value now makes all the sense in the world. And when you talk about value, what are you talking about? There I'm talking about generic value. The, the okay. academic definition of value is what's expensive is growth, what's cheap is value. Right. And that, that definition I think is fine as far as it goes, but um, usually in academia they define it by price to book value, which is a lousy measure. Mm -hmm. Book value ignores all intangibles. If I spend a grand on a desk, my book value just went up a thousand. If I spend a million on R&D, which is the essence of what my company does, uh, book value is not affected. Well, that doesn't right. make sense. So if you include intangibles in book value, you actually get a much more powerful value metric. But you can use price earnings, price to cash flow, price to book, preferably adjusted for intangibles. Rob, you mentioned if you have the courage <laughs> to invest in value stocks at this point, uh, why do 
you think we're going to need courage because this discrepancy between growth and value could last for a while longer? Is that why? Well, that's one of many reasons. Um, yeah. With value investing, you're you're always buying companies that are out of favor and unloved. So that's yeah. one element that requires courage. Chasing the most popular and beloved companies is easy. Um, secondly, it goes against human nature. The the newly cheap stocks got there by inflicting pain and losses. And right. it goes against human nature to say, oh, I want more of that. Um, trimming your holdings to newly extravagantly expensive stocks goes against human nature because those companies created great profit and joy on the way to being very expensive. Mm -hmm. So human nature conditions us to run away from what looks fearful or fearsome. And uh, that goes back to our ancestry on the African Veld. Uh, okay. And yet success in investing uh, often will benefit from embracing what seems to be dangerous, but is already f where the danger is already fully discounted in the share price. Let me ask you about the PIMCO All Asset Fund, which you launched in 2002. You had an objective it's a real, uh, you know, returns after inflation to beat the CPI, consumer price index by 5% annualized over a full market cycle, and also to diversify away from the developed markets that tended to be expensive. How has that worked out with the PIMCO All Asset Fund? Have you, have you met those objectives? Yeah, we have. Um, the okay. CPI plus five target we've exceeded, the correlation with existing mainstream stocks and bonds has been uh, very low by the standards of most global asset allocation strategies. Now, one headwind we hit was that in the 2010s, it was very hard to beat US 6040. And uh, we right, like to describe 60%, stock- 60% right, stocks and 40% bonds, right? Right, and we like to describe uh, mainstream stocks as first pillar of successful investing mainstream bonds as the second pillar and diversifiers as the third pillar. This is a third pillar strategy. And mm -hmm. the 2010s was a lousy decade for diversifying markets. Um, we did well relative to those markets. Now, at this stage, mainstream stocks and bonds are expensive, right? which means that their forward looking returns are lousy. And the diversifying markets are out of favor and cheap, and so their forward-looking returns are likely to be very good. We, we have um, a website called Asset Allocation Interactive that's a tool that provides expectations of forward returns over the next decade on 130 different markets around the world. And U.S. 60-40, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, is currently forecast to have a return that's less than 2% per year for the next wow. 10 years. Diversifiers, so are, mm -hmm. yeah, diversifiers in the 5 to 6% range, and that's without any effort to pick and choose which ones are best. Uh, emerging market stocks are around 8%. Emerging markets value looks to be 4 to 6% higher than emerging market stocks, which puts you in the 12 to 14% range for annual returns for 10 years. I, I like things that are cheap. I've often been called a perma bear. I'm not a bear when things are cheap. Rob, which assets look particularly uh, undervalued at this point when you look around the globe? I think plain vanilla international stocks, MSCI EFA looks pretty good, 6 7% annualized return, which in a zero yield environment is very good. Mm -hmm. And value stocks in developed economies, 3 to 4% better than that. Well, that gets you up around 10% returns. That's great. Emerging markets, um, stocks, not all cheap. The tech companies in emerging markets we have our FANG stocks, they have their BAT stocks, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. Those stocks right. are, were at their peak price parapasu with our FANG stocks. Very, mm -hmm. very expensive. But at the other end of the spectrum, uh, emerging markets value stocks have a yield, dividend yield of 4 to 5%. That's pretty cool. Emerging markets bonds have a yield that's higher than U.S. junk bonds. Well, 
some would say that's because they're junk. No, they're not. No. Most of them mm -hmm. are uh, uh, solid credits with a very low risk of default. Right. So emerging markets bonds would be where I'd want to put my bond money and international and emerging market stocks, the stock money. I love U.S. assets when they're cheap. They're not. <laughs> Inflation. Uh, you know, discussed with the PIMCO All Asset Fund that, you know, you, you want to beat inflation by 5% and we uh, have. annualized. Right. And you have. Uh, so how seriously are you taking the resurgence of inflation uh, in the U.S. and actually around the world? How should we adjust our investment strategies based on uh, a resurgence of inflation? Well, firstly, a resurgence of inflation is not a foregone conclusion. But okay. we do think it's very high odds. Uh, people say, look, back in the global financial crisis, we printed money hand over fist, we engaged in massive stimulus, and there was no inflation as a result. Well, pardon me, but the monetary stimulus back then stayed on the balance sheet of the Fed. It didn't get out into the macro economy. Now it's getting out into the macro economy. The stimulus was on a scale of... Um, uh, ballpark of 5% of GDP. Now it's on a scale of 10, 12% of GDP. This, right. this is a totally different and, in my view, reckless uh, pursuit of fiscal and monetary stimulus at a time when the economy is recovering handily all on its own. So th it's very dangerous. Now, where does it become the most dangerous? A uh, couple of places. Firstly, when you pay people not to work, then they'll, they'll only go back to work if they're paid a good deal more than what was their market wage. If businesses move ahead and pay them much more than what used to be their market wage, um, they have to pass on those costs. And businesses are finding right now that they can pass on incremental costs very, very well. Mm -hmm. So that means wage push inflation. Right. Now, I in addition, seen that in a while. Yeah, in addition to that, um, housing prices are central to uh, an inflationary surge. Housing prices up 17 percent year over year. Um, rents up four and a half percent, give or take. And what they call owner's equivalent rent. Owner's equivalent rent is uh, a survey of multiple homeowners asking, "What do you think your home would rent for if you were to rent it out today?" It's just a subjective guess. But it's a subjective guess averaged across um, thousands of homeowners. And so it does pick up on changes in inflation, but it does it with a lag. So you have housing inflation, housing price inflation, 17% year over year, and owner's equivalent rent up less than 3% year over year. This is going to play catch up. Maybe the appreciation of homes is um, transitory to use the mm -hmm. Fed's most favorite word. Um, mm -hmm. But the catch-up of owner's equivalent rent, which is the, the largest single component of CPI inflation, the largest single component of CPI inflation, if it plays catch-up and spreads that 17% over the next three years, that's 5% plus inflation. So I see the inflation risk as very real. What does inflation risk do to mainstream uh, bonds? pushes interest rates higher. Yes. And so unless the rates are aggressively manipulated to hold them artificially far below the rate of inflation, mm -hmm. th that's bad news for bond returns. And what does it do for stocks? Well, it's interesting. We did a paper called King of the Mountain a few years ago in which we looked at the linkage between inflation rates, real interest rates, and market valuations. We found a sweet spot. When, when uh, real interest rates over and above inflation are 2 to 3%, and inflation is 2 to 3%, things are nice and steady. Um, the inflation is manageable. It's not, it's not negligible, but it's manageable, and businesses can plan accordingly. Uh, the real interest rate serves as a speed bump to discourage stupid ideas. Um, and so businesses prosper handily, and the, and the result is that the natural level of the P.E. ratio is around 25 times earnings when you get to that level. Now, if the last 12 months 
were to be sustained the last 12 right. months. You've got five and a half inflation. You've got interest rates of one, which means minus four and a half uh, real rates. Um, when you get to inflation levels that high, real interest rates that low, the natural P.E. ratio is more like 10 or 12 times. Wow. Which, which and today's multiples, if you look at, the, I, I'm using the Schiller P.E. ratio, which is uh -huh. price relative to 10-year smoothed earnings. The current Schiller P.E. ratio is 38 times. So if the natural rate for that is 10 to 12, then we're playing with fire. And we can still put the inflation genie back in the bottle, but it'll be, require uh, reining in the stimulus in a way that I don't see uh, either party willing to do right now. All right. Therefore, it sounds to me as if uh, this inflation, in your view, is not transitory and actually could be quite damaging to both the bond and the stock markets. Mm -hmm. One of my uh, favorite economists is um, with B of A, uh, Savita Subramanian, and mm -hmm. she coined an expression three months ago that I think is just marvelous. She declared a risk of transitory hyperinflation, <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> suggesting that inflation would go to high single digits, possibly beyond, and would settle wow. back down. But the key question is, does it settle back down to two in which case it's relatively benign, or does it settle back down to five, in which case we have a reckoning ahead of us. Yes. So that's what I worry about. I love the way the U.S. economy has rebounded, has shown such tremendous resilience, has continued to be an innovation leader for the world, but that's in the share price. At 38 times earnings, that's in the share price. And the big beneficiaries of technological innovation aren't the innovators, it's their customers. Mm -hmm. uh, their customers are the world. So is Europe at half our uh, valuation multiple a better place to invest? My goodness, yes. Is Are the emerging markets 60% cheaper than us an even better place to invest? Absolutely. So. I look ahead over the coming decade and I see um, some wonderful places to invest. They just don't happen to be here. Which leads me to the one investment question, the what should we all own some of in a long-term diversified portfolio? What would your choice be? My choice would be emerging markets value. Most investors have nothing, zero invested in it. Um, it's very lightly correlated with mainstream US stocks and bonds. Since I'm not a broker dealer, I'm not actually allowed to offer advice on what right. funds to own, but I am allowed to say what I own. So yes. uh, some of my bigger holdings are um, uh, PIMCO's uh, Emerging Markets RAE strategy, which stands for Research Affiliates Equity, um, which is available in two flavors. One uh, uses an additional kicker of PIMCO Bond Alpha. Uh, uh, ticker PEFIX, uh, and one just invests directly in emerging markets value stocks, PEIFX. So I have holdings in both. Uh, Schwab has a fundamental index for emerging markets, FNDE. Uh, it's an ETF. And for those who want something a little out of the mainstream, um, there's a new ish fund. It's been around for two, three years. Uh, which is ticker FRDM. Uh, it's an emerging markets equity strategy that invests in uh, 10 emerging markets countries, choosing the 10 that are most free, that have wow. the most human freedom, and weights them by metrics of human freedom. Well, if you want to support the idea of human freedom, I think it's mm -hmm. a really cool idea, and um, I have uh, a decent chunk of my personal portfolio in that one. Rob Arnott, thank you so much for joining us on Wealth Track. You always provide us a wealth of ideas and information and insights. We really appreciate it. It's a real privilege. At the close of every Wealth Track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. 
This week's action point is one we have suggested several times in the past. It is make sure you are truly diversified. Well, how do you do that? The late great financial historian Peter Bernstein, the author of Against the Gods, The Remarkable Story of Risk, told us many years ago on Wealth Track that you are not truly diversified until you own something that makes you uncomfortable. That usually means unpopular, underperforming, and cheap. In today's markets, uncomfortable covers a wide range of assets investors have been shunning, including two we just discussed, value stocks and emerging market securities. Take a hard look at your portfolio and see what uncomfortable assets are missing and consider adding some so that you are truly diversified. Next week, financial risk expert Rick Bookstaber discusses the new market risk challenging investors. In this week's extra feature, Arnott discusses the surprising impact that recent geopolitical events could have on the financial markets. Please continue to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. As always, thanks for spending your valuable time with us. Make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and a productive one.